Let's all, uh, let's just start by sitting back at our chairs. Your feet comfortably flat on the floor. Your hands wherever they're comfortable for you. Close your eyes. Let's take a breath. Let it all the way out. Take a few moments to kind of become present in your body. Notice the feeling of your body as it presses down into the seat beneath. Notice the feeling of your feet on the floor, the weight of your arms. Come present to the warmth or coolness on your skin, particularly on the palms of your hands and on your face. Notice the rhythm of your breathing, if there is a rhythm. Notice any sounds around you. Notice the overall energy field inside your body. Take another deep breath. And let it all the way out. And then just open your eyes back up. For some of you, that might have been a profoundly relaxing experience and a grounding and centering experience. And for some of you, it might not have been. And so, you may want to ask yourself, what, what were you unwilling to stop thinking about? What were you unable to stop feeling? And you don't have to answer me, but it's a good question to ask yourself, is what's going on inside of me that's preventing me from being completely in the now? Everybody take one hand, put it out alongside of you, just like that. Pull back three fingers so you're making the sign of a gun. Touch the tip of your first finger to your thumb so you have a circle. Look at your circle. Look at my circle. Put it right in your chin and freeze. And look how few of you know where your chin is. <laughs> yeah, we, we operate in patterns. That's, that's how I'm able to uh, successfully perform magic, uh, is because I know those patterns. And uh, I get to do an end run around something, because I know how you think. And I know how your mind behaves. Uh, and in fact, even in the context of that little exercise, most of you laughed. Might have, some of you might have thought, boy, what a clever, funny guy he is. And some of you might have thought, what a jerk. He just... Uh, he just forced me to make a fool of myself. So there might be anger or shame or irritation, and that's a pattern too, worth looking at. Where do I go? Where do I go? <coughs> Let me tell you how I prepared for this talk. You know, I'm, I'm used to being a charismatic speaker <laughs> in front of big groups of people doing big hypnosis shows and walking large stages and spending a lot of time preparing my talks. <coughs> Uh, and writing a lot and preparing a lot and doing it well in advance. Um, and in this case, I decided uh, uh, to write very little and to do it at the last minute, to wait as long as I possibly could. If I had had the courage, I would have waited even longer until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but faith mind only goes so far. And, uh, but let me tell you what I, what I did do was that for the last month, just about exactly a month, I've been meditating between four and six hours a day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's not always a pretty sight. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, I'd hoped to be enlightened by now. Uh, not, not having won that war, I'm still in the midst of the battle, so this will be uh, sort of like uh, notes from the trenches. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll say something that uh, 
might be of value to you, or more importantly to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, as you see, I, I made some notes. I uh, uh, may refer to them a little bit, but my, my goal is to really provide you with what I call fresh baked bread, which is wisdom hot off the, hot off the press. You know, what's coming up right now? What's real right now? What are some of the uh, experiences that I'm processing and dealing with? And as I get to know you better and you get to know me better during the course of this hour together, uh, I hope to be perhaps even more courageous and forthcoming and real with you and, uh, and, and you with me. That's, that's my invitation. So, you know, my greatest fear whenever I do something like this is that you all know everything I'm about to say. <laughs> And my greatest comfort is knowing that you're all way too smart to have actually gotten any benefit from it. <laughs> because our minds really gobble this stuff up. It's what Trunk Parimpache calls spiritual materialism. You know, we like to we like to have uh, a, a working knowledge of spirituality, uh, and then we have concepts and constructs and ideas and beliefs, and we think that that's going to get us somewhere. And it generally doesn't. Those things generally don't actually produce results. The only thing that produces results is doing the work. Um, and, you know, I don't care how simple you've made your lives. Most of us, I think, are too terrified to, um, to do the inner work that ultimately leads to inner peace. Uh, so I thought what I would do is I'd start by reading the title and description that I created for this presentation, uh, partly to remind myself what the hell I'm doing here, <laughs> and uh, partly to see if I could use this as a framework for what we're going to be discussing. So I called this simple tools to overcome the complexity of your mind. <coughs> I assume we all share in the complex mind. Mm -hmm. um, if simplicity is a desired and cherished state of living, what stops us from embracing it fully? Quite simply, it's our mental addiction to thought, identity, and that which is familiar. And the discomfort we must pass through on the way to a quiet mind. So I hate to break it to you, but thought is an addiction. And like any addiction, when you stop or you attempt to stop, there is a period of withdrawal. And it shows up in the form of resistance and pain and fear and all kinds of very tough stuff and speaking personally and very presently, it sucks. <laughs> and I'm going to ask your permission because I've already used some, uh, some language <laughs> in my shares before. It threw me into a shame cycle and I just did again using the word suck. So is it okay if I use words like sucks? And yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> Without simplicity of mind, all attempts at external simplicity are doomed to fail. Until we withdraw from our own minds, there's no hope of withdrawing from our habitual patterns of seeking comfort, sensory stimulation, personal power, and status. <coughs> what do you seek? What are you looking for? What do you find yourself going back to? More importantly, our emotions hold sway over our minds. When we're triggered by external events, or sometimes just by our own heads, we react and add fuel to the fire, or do we meet the challenge with a calm and balanced mind? And I think we all see the value of doing the latter, but often we are habituated to doing the former. We re-engage our complex minds. So my intentions are to broaden our conception of simplicity, to include the mental piece, uh, to enhance our ability to stop the mental storms that pull us in. To clarify how meditation and mindfulness and these tools that we'll discuss here today can work and, and, and how you can really use some very specific tools. You can do some actual things that will enhance your experience of simplicity. And, um, and then some on the battlefield methods, some things that you could do in the midst of your life when life really starts to like kick your butt. And um, you become emotional, angry, irritated, shameful, whatever it is. What do you do right then? None of it works unless you've been doing the work up to then. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we all have a simplicity journey. I'll tell you a little bit about mine. I, I, was, uh, I was a successful chiropractor president of the Vermont Chiropractic Association. By the way, 
awesome, awesome presentation. Fantastic. Um, and uh, I had a very successful uh, experience in that, but on the inside it was starting to get kind of old. I wasn't really enjoying it. I wasn't enjoying the way that my life was um, uh, becoming about what I was gathering and accruing, and a lot like what you guys were talking about. It seemed like time to leave, and it took me a long time to gather the courage to leave, and I had the good fortune to come across a book called How to Win by Quitting. And I read the book, and it, it changed my life, and I uh, ended up leaving my chiropractic practice and ultimately going to Guatemala. I want to be sensitive to time, but I want to tell you a really good story. Can I tell you a cool story about that? This is actually one of the stories in my book. I was... Uh, first day in Antigua, Guatemala, and I had, um, I had made that leap of faith into the, into the void, and I, um, I'm walking down the streets of Antigua, Guatemala, and there, down one of these beautiful little side streets, is a chiropractic office. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, how interesting, I'm going and meet the chiropractor. So I, I introduced myself to this American expatriate who's running a practice there. I said, hey, I'm Steve. I'm a chiropractor from the United States. He says, oh, that's great. I haven't had an adjustment in six months. Can you give me an adjustment? <laughs> Just like that, I'm back to work again. So, you know, so I gave him an adjustment. And after the adjustment, we went back out into his waiting room. And sitting in his waiting room is an American gentleman. Stands up and he says, hey, how you doing? I'm Steve. I'm a chiropractor from the United States. <laughs> I said, I'm Steve. I'm a chiropractor. From there. Said, Where are you from? He goes, uh, or no, I said, what are you doing in Guatemala? I just, he says, I just uh, you know, kind of came here to work on my spiritual journey, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, How long did you practice for? He says, well, I don't. I just sold my practice. <laughs> How long did you practice for? 14 years, same as me. So we figured this was uh, something, you know, when those moments come in life, it's like maybe I better listen. So we went out and um, we, we, we went to his, uh, his place to pick up some his wallet, I guess, so he could go get something to eat. And, uh, and sitting on his shelf was a book, How to Win by Quitting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we ended up finding out a lot of very cool things about each other that were one remarkable coincidence after another. You know, Ram Dass says, when you follow your spiritual nose, all sorts of flowers appear on the path. And uh, who is it? Um, who said, uh, this is William Murray, the explorer, who said, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, a chance to throw back. But once you commit yourself, providence moves too. It's in the book, too. It's a great quote. Um, I've got books, by the way, for anybody who wants one, for anybody who could get them before they're gone. Uh, so, yeah, I, um, I got back to the United States uh, after spending some time with this guy, and I... Um, I went to the guy who bought my practice and I said, I'm about to embark on a journey. I'd just gotten back from a journey, I'm going to embark on another one. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a private pilot and I had a plane at the time, so I was going to fly around the country. He says, where are you going? I said, well, my first stop is Bozeman, Montana. He goes, I said, uh, you know, I've got a, I've got a friend there. Uh, this was Steve, my Steve friend who was from Bozeman. So, so he goes, this is my chiropractic, the guy who bought my practice. He goes, I used to live in Bozeman. I said, well, I'm going to visit my friend uh, Steve Forte. He goes, he was my chiropractor. <laughs> and he says, and my best friend bought his practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, there's all kinds of lessons in that, I think, right? About following your spiritual nose. But, um, but Guatemala is where I learned about nothing. You know, here's what I learned. I think, you know, having nothing, like letting go of what you have. You guys can all relate to this. Letting go of what you have is hard. Uh, letting go of what you do is even harder. Letting go of what you think, that's, that's harder still. And letting go of who you are or who you think you are, that's virtually impossible. But it's like fasting. So, you know, sometimes you fast in order to experience the pain of the thing that you think you need until you realize you don't need it anymore, and then suddenly you're free. So that's the path to freedom. So I think we're all addicted to who we think we are. Um, you know, even when we let our addictions go, comfort, the big house, um, the prestigious school, the, the status, all that, uh, we very quickly fall back into the same traps because we haven't rooted out the original addiction, which is the addiction to thought. 
nature abhors a vacuum. I wrote that down, nature, ab nature abhors a vacuum. Um, simplicity can be its own trap, right? Because uh, it's an invitation for making your mind more complex, if you let it. You could definitely make your whole life about how to be more simple, right? I, I'm the kind of guy, I take great comfort in how organized I am. I've got a little place for everything and everything in its place. And uh, you were talking about having empty things and not wanting to put anything in your empty things. And I thought, that's an addiction too. You know? And it's, it's, a, it's a better one, I think, than, you know, than heroin, but only by that much. <laughs> so, so <laughs> it's just, they're all, this is what you have to start looking through at it all. I'm not to pick on you, it's to, to look at it all through the frame of addiction and identification, who we think we are. So, so what are your addictions? I, like my, my thing is time. I'm a, I'm a time nut. If I'm driving from a show that I just did in Boston, and I'm going back to Burlington, Vermont, and I know it's three hours and 15 minutes, and I plan on getting there in exactly three hours and 15 minutes, and that means that I've got to pass White River Junction in an hour and 35 minutes, and I've got to pass Randolph at you know, an hour and 10 minutes, and I've got to get to the rest stop north of that in exactly an hour before I get to where I'm going, then I know I'm on track. And I will actually miss everything beautiful about the drive in an effort to allow time to dominate my life. And I could call it simplicity. I could call it being organized and structured, but it's, it's neurosis. Um, so I think I wrote that the reality is that, that I use my efforts at simplicity as a clever way to keep me out of the now. So look at that for yourselves. What is it about now? What is it about now? Now. That's so terrifying that we resist it in every possible way. And speaking for myself, it's about, um, it's about emotions, you know? It's like scary. It's really scary to sit quietly in a room alone. It's really scary to feel boredom and insecurity and shame and fear and all that stuff that <clears throat> it's a lot easier to go to the movies. It's a lot easier uh, to, buy, you know, to you know, buy the next big thing, especially if you're charging it. That's like, you know, like sticking your thumb and you know, your finger in the light socket. You, know, it's, you, you get the jolt and then you pay for it forever after, right? So, so the question is, what is this root source of suffering? Because if you, could, if you could root that out, you're in good shape. Otherwise, complexity will always take hold again. Either In two ways. Here's how complexity comes back and gets you. Either by refilling the void that you made before. So you got rid of the SUV and now you're going to go out and obsess over the smaller car that you're going to get, right? But it's still the same kind of obsession, right? Um, anybody here ever been to an AA meeting? Whether you were just as a guest, I mean, okay. So you go to an AA meeting, here's what you see a lot of. Coffee and cigarettes. Lots and lots of smoking and, and caffeine. Why? Because we substituted one addiction for another addiction, right? It's not... It's not the same thing as being free. Um, so that's one way we do it. The second way that I think is a more insidious way that we allow complexity to retake hold of our lives is that we, um, we identify with it. We identify with, I'm the simple one now, right? I'm better than you. I'm simpler than you. I've done the work and you haven't. So, uh, you know, good on me, bad on you. And then being identified with the simple one is another form of complexity. It's another, it's your brain is still filling itself up. It's not with a car, but you're still, you know, I mean, you may not be spewing toxic fumes into the air with your SUV, but trust me, you're spewing toxic fumes into the air. You're being toxic because you still have judgment. Am I losing anybody here? Is this like you're all very quiet and hoping it's just that you're being very attentive. I never speak this way. <laughs> I mean, I talk to my friends this way. I never get up in front of a group of people and just talk like this. So um, I'm hoping it's a gift and not a burden to you. <laughs> so far, so good. So far, so good. Thank you. Okay, rapt attention. attention I can handle. So, um, so I, I, this is something I wrote down. It was really an interesting aha for me, and I, I'll share it, and, and I don't know if it makes sense uh, to you, and I think it makes sense to me. 
I wrote that the absence of something sometimes leaves a bigger shadow than the thing itself. You brought that up uh, a little bit earlier, Jean-Francois, when you mentioned the thing about, am I identified as an ex-smoker, right? That idea, I'm an ex-smoker, and that's a, just as big an identity as being a smoker. It's just as big a trap, right? So, in fact, sometimes bigger. You, know, you guys know people who quit smoking, and they're the biggest pains in the ass in the world, because now they've got to like proselytize to you. So they're giving you all their stuff on top of it. So, I mean, before they might have been smoking, but at least they were living and letting live, and now they're like all over you. So, so the question is, you know, is the absence of something bigger than the thing itself? Materialism, which we all would like to let go of. We don't want to be materialistic, but imagine that materialism can be for the thing or it could be for its absence. I'm just as addicted to the thing not being here as I was a minute ago to the thing being here. It's just as important to me to not have this as it was to have it. It's still a trap. You're still stuck. You're still in bondage. Um, so, so there's some kind of change in these. You, know, you guys know what a dry drunk is, somebody who's a dry drunk? It's somebody who stopped drinking, but they're still addicted to the fact that they you know, that they were an alcoholic and all they do and all they do is think about alcohol or, or think about how they're not drinking. It's you know, and they're they tend to be very they haven't done their work. They haven't done their inner work. So that's what we're here to, to talk about today is to they do your inner work. All right. Here's the real distinction. The real distinction is your mind is either quiet or it's reactive. That's it. Your mind is either quiet or it's reactive. A reactive mind is not simple and no matter how much closet cleaning you do. It's not going to be simple. Any more than a makeover is going to make your life better. You know, getting a makeover, you've seen those makeover shows, sometimes they help a little bit, right? They give you a vision of how your life could be, what you could look like, and it's, a, it's the outside-in approach, and sometimes it's got value. But it's often short-lived, especially if you don't do the inner work. Uh, on hypnosis. Um, I was uh, I, I sold my chiropractic practice. I, I was already doing magic as a uh, as a second profession. I was performing all these cool things, and then I, I came back from Guatemala and I studied stage hypnosis and I became a stage hypnotist. And I started doing these big shows uh, all over the country and in the Caribbean. I became the official hypnotist for Spring Break. <laughs> It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm I'm doing my show. This thing really gets me every time. Oh. So he pulls a chair out from under you. <laughs> All right, so so I'm doing my show, and I, I do these things on stage where I have people think they're milking a cow or conducting an orchestra, or uh, I'll have a guy think he's pregnant. I'll have another guy think he's the father. <laughs> Very socially conscious things. I decided to try a new routine. One, uh, and this is on stage in Jamaica or Barbados or somewhere. And I had a guy, and I said, "When you wake up, three things are going to happen." I said, "Number one, you don't believe you're hypnotized, even though you are." I said, "Number two, this is the worst show you've ever seen, and you are pissed at me." And I said, "Number three, <laughs> there's an invisible wall about three feet in front of you." <laughs> This was a complete experiment. I had no idea what was going to happen, right? <laughs> so, but that was, I had the crowd, you know, that's when you do your experiments, is when you have the crowd. So, uh, so I wake everybody up and say, how's everybody doing? Everybody's like, we're great, we're good, we're great. And this one guy says, you suck! <laughs> and I said, excuse me? He says, this show is terrible. I said, well, then leave. The guy gets up and goes, <laughs> get out of here. As he finally sits back down, crosses his arms, starts to pout. I said, what's the matter? He goes, nothing. I said, are you, are you having fun? He goes, no. I said, are you hypnotized? He goes, no. I said, then why don't you leave? He goes, I'm not going to give you the satisfaction. <laughs> It all kind of came together for me in that moment because I realized that's like all of us, right? We're all hypnotized, right? We all have somewhere we want to go in our lives. We have something we want to accomplish, something we want to achieve. 
an ideal that we want to live up to, a way we want to be in relation to others, a way we want to contribute to the world. Uh, and we start moving towards it and, and we hit our invisible walls, which are completely manufactured by our own subconscious mind. It's, a, it's our enculturation. It's what we learn from our parents, from our schools, from our churches, from all the things that taught us to be who we think we need to be. All the reasons why when, you know, when you say to somebody, you know, I'm giving away my books or my pictures, they're like, what are you talking about? Are you having problems at the, whole, at the house? They, they, they don't even grok it because they're so hypnotized and fast asleep. And Gurdjieff said the first step for escaping from prison is realizing you're in prison. Right? The first step is realizing that there are these boxes that you're living inside of. And that's the, what you guys are all challenging yourselves to realize. And as you start to move forward and start to like, let go of your habitual way of being and the enculturated view of how life is supposed to be, you hit those walls and they're not always very pretty. It's not, sometimes it doesn't work out very well. It's hard, you know, you're, you're still stuck behind some of them. So I wrote this book on hypnosis because I thought if we could only <coughs> recognize our invisible walls. We always start to like, like in the challenging conversations that you have when you're talking to people about being simple, and you see their reactions. Their reactions convey a wall they didn't even know was there. They didn't even realize that there was another way, right? And you see that all the time. That's the gift that you guys are all giving the world, by the way. It's like you're opening people up to the possibility that life is bigger than they thought it was. And a lot of people don't want to hear that because this is a comfortable little shoebox I've got myself in. So. Waking up means becoming present. Becoming present helps you see through the illusions. It gives you access to your wisdom. And it helps everything. Your relationships, your health, your business, every facet of your life. How do you wake up? That's the question. How do you do it, right? Because if inner simplicity is the only thing that's going to give you outer simplicity in a lasting way, this is all very chiropractic, by the way. It's all very chiropractic. You know, as a chiropractor, we always talked about how, uh, you know, nature needs no help, it just needs no interference. Health is from the inside out, right? You just need to remove the blocks and the interference. Here I'm talking about walls that we want to remove so that you will manifest well-being, right? And you'll wake up, you'll feel awake, you'll feel alive, you'll feel in a state of joy, you'll feel free, you won't be like stuck in your little bubble, you won't be you know, in a state of, of fear and panic and self-loathing and all that other stuff that you carry around with you. And, and for a while, you'll still carry around with you, but you'll start realizing little by little more and more that it's not real until eventually, God willing, it begins to drop away. And then life gets really cool. I broke this down into five steps. We all like steps. I don't really make these up. I just kind of renamed them. A lot of these were made up by like the Buddha and Jesus and people who are way wiser than I am. Uh, so, so the first step, I'm going to call. I I didn't know what to call. I honest to goodness, I you know these my notes are like got two pages of random chicken scratch here. That's what I'm looking at from time to time, and I. <laughs> Half the stuff I'm looking at, I don't even know why I wrote it. <laughs> it's like a Jerry Seinfeld thing where he wakes up in the middle of the night and he writes some stuff like a really funny thing and he wakes up the next morning, has no idea what he says. He's like, what does this mean? What did I say here? I don't know what I'm saying. So, uh, so I'm still naming it as we speak. This is what's called faith mind, by the way. Faith mind is, uh, is, is the practice of, of um, being radical with... Uh, with your words and your, com and your communication. It's like being out there, it's vulnerability, right? Being vulnerable, being raw, being real, being, like you, get, you demonstrated that so beautifully. It was like, a, and it's just so heartwarming to see somebody just be real in the moment. Uh, so we're gonna call this first step basic goodness. That's the third or fourth name I gave it. 
Basic goodness, order, simplicity, morality. Right, so basically, you want to walk the spiritual path, you want to quiet your mind, you want to become simple on the inside and then let that inform your simplicity on the outside or enhance it or f fulfill it and strengthen it. And it doesn't have to come first. You, know, you could be doing all the external simplicity stuff and then go back to this. And it'll keep you simpler longer and make it realer and deeper. It's like what Thoreau said, um, if you've built castles in the air, or in this case, you know, mini houses <laughs> you know, in, in the air, your work need not be lost. Now put foundations under them. So this is the foundation. Okay, so the first step, uh, which I guess what I call basic goodness, basic goodness. Um, this is what we're doing here. This is simplicity. Simplicity fil fits into the category of basic goodness. Live simply so others may simply live. Create order out of chaos. Don't carry a lot of baggage through your life that you then end up dumping on other people. Right? That's, that's the simplicity, that, that's the, the basic goodness. Morality. I'm, I, I grew up Jewish. You know, I'm Jewish on my parents' side. Um, <laughs> we say, be a mensch. Be a mensch. Be a mensch. Basically, just means like be a good person, be a person of character, right? Um, don't, you know, don't do damage. Don't speak kindly. You know, operate from a from a, uh, you know, from a code of morality and conduct and ethics, and just be a good person. That's that's the foundation. Um, this is the domain of religion too, right? Religion is all about basic goodness. All religion is all about. Um, but the problem with religion, this is me, again, you know, if you're a religious person, this if this rubs you the wrong way, I'm sorry, but I think in general religion it falls far short as a vehicle for, for self-realization because it does the one thing. It does, it, it, here's what my review of religion is, a code of conduct and consequences for non-compliance. Do this, 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 and this, and if you don't, you're going to go to hell. That's, that's kind of the deal, right? Very seldom do people think of it like, okay, well, this is a code of conduct that allows me to create a foundation of basic goodness in which I can now begin the work of calming, quieting, simplifying my mind, becoming the person I want to be on the inside. That's why to me, religion is a, a lovely step as long as you don't get addicted to the form of what it is and forget that there's actually a reason it exists. Step two, silence. It's probably we're going to spend, I mean, I'm going to spend the most time talking about silence. How ironic is that? Um, this, is about, this is about focus, <coughs> concentration, and practice. Our minds are very noisy. I'll prove it to you right now. How many of you just heard silence? How many of you just heard yourself saying, why, is he, why isn't he talking? <laughs> right? OK, so we, we fill in the blanks. Our minds are not comfortable with silence, and so we end up creating our reality out of the words we speak to ourselves. We create the illusion of our lives through our words. And we need to learn how to step away from those words, how to create inner peace, inner silence. And it's a martial art. This isn't easy. This isn't something that just happens. It's not like you pray for silence and poof, you, maybe some of you have, but most people I know have had to work pretty hard to quiet their minds. I'm working really hard right now. My mind is far from quiet. But I will tell you that when it is, I'm in much better shape than when it's not. How are we doing so far? I'm checking in. Is this still rapt attention I'm seeing, or is it like glazed over boredom and confusion? Are we good? Yep. Okay. Uh, Earlier on, we were um, uh, when you guys were, were giving your presentation, uh, and you were asking people to share, and I and I made some comments. I said something that was kind of glib, 
and um, and I didn't get the the laughter that I expected to get, which I interpreted it as disapproval, because I'm neurotic. <laughs> so um, so then I went into a shame spiral. You know what a shame spiral is? Anybody here ever like say something like you walk into a room, you say the wrong thing to the wrong people, and now you're completely stuck? Yeah. Have you all had that experience? Yeah. Please raise your hands. That's <laughs> it. Oh my god. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I got into that, and you know, luckily I've been meditating four to six hours a day, so I had a little bit of a, you know, I had a little bit of an ability to step back and say, "There is your brain doing that thing to you again." And maybe another couple months from now, if my brain were doing that to me, I'd be even able to remove myself more from it. But where I am now, although it's profoundly uncomfortable when that happens, it's still far more conscious and functional than actually believing everything inside my own head. And most of us believe every single thing we say to ourselves every single minute of the day. And you get a random thought and you chase it around and you just, you're gone. And that's what leads you down the path to eventually, you know, replacing the SUV with the Prius, with the this, with the that, and filling yourself up. And, you know, because, because you don't know how to stop the thought. That's the problem. You need, to, you need quiet. You need inner quiet. So should we talk about a few ways to help achieve that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll share two. Two things that you might consider doing. Um, we've already kind of done one of them. And the other one I'll, I'll kind of bring it all together. First thing I want you to do right now is um, take a moment and just look around the room. Just you know, look at stuff. You know, it could be people or it could just be stuff. It doesn't matter what you're looking at. Just notice. Take a moment and notice what's in the space. All right. And it, now, now take another moment and, and notice sounds. Shift your attention to your own physical body. Notice the feeling of your butt on the, on the chair. Wait. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel the, the presence of life in your body. Eckhart Tolle had a great way to describe this. He says, if you don't know what I mean by that, because it's not esoteric, this is just plain, duh, real, okay? He says, if you don't know what I mean by this, he says, put your hands out, close your eyes, and now ask yourself a question, how do I know, without opening my eyes, that I still have hands? There's a felt sense, there's a feeling, right? There's just, there's just a sense, an energy perhaps, an awareness of it being, of its being. So you're looking around, you're listening, you're feeling. You're hearing, you're seeing, you're feeling. You're hearing, you're seeing, you're feeling. Simple practice. Most of us don't do it. Most of us, like as, uh, this is another Eckhart Tolle line I thought, he says, most people walk through life with just barely enough attention not to walk into walls. <laughs> right? This is what Ram Dass said, be here now. Be here now, it's not esoteric. Just like, be here now, right? Right now I feel my feet, right now I feel my body, right now I see the room, I see you, I feel the air, I hear the humming of the, whatever the electronic noises are in this room, I'm, I'm here. That's being present, okay? The more you do that intentionally, the quieter your mind becomes. I used to do an exercise with people where I would say, let's practice silence, Everybody close your eyes and get silent for a minute. And then I'd wait about 10 seconds and I'd say, okay, stop. How many of you have already had your first thought? <laughs> and of course, everybody has. Well, then I say, okay, now close your eyes and feel like your butt, feel your feet, feel your hands, feel the air, feel the air going through your lungs, listen to the sounds. Wait a minute, open your eyes. How many of you, you know, felt silence? And you do. 
your mind quiets down because you're attentive, you're becoming the watcher. There is an experience of attention. It's just an experience of attention. And so once you begin to key in on that, the next thing you do with it is um, to notice that you're the one watching it. You're the one hearing it. You're the one feeling your butt. It just becomes an awareness that you are aware. That's an exercise. Simple exercise every day. I'm doing it hours on a, uh, at a time. It basically goes like this. <sighs> Become aware of all the things that I can sense. Become aware that I am aware of the things that I sense. Notice my awareness. My awareness is empty. My awareness has no thoughts. It has no beliefs. It has no you know, opinions. It has no needs or cravings. My awareness is just my awareness. The esoteric philosophers tell us that my awareness is your awareness. Your awareness is my awareness. We're all, it's just the awareness. It's not mine or yours. It's just, it's yours tapping into something kind of very beautiful. What it feels like inside is my mind gets quiet. I'm not listening to my head. Another way to do this, I've done two 10-day um, silent Vipassana meditation retreats. Have any of you, how many of you know what Vipassana meditation is? A couple of you do. Yeah. Have you ever done it? No, I have a cousin who's going to create an online. Totally amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very fantastic. Uh, Vipassana meditation is essentially the meditation that the Buddha taught. It's not Buddhism because Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. It was just a guy teaching. You know, some other people came along and decided it was a religion. Okay. Um, he was teaching you how to quiet your mind. He was teaching you how to end suffering. How do you end suffering? You end suffering by detaching from craving. How do you detach from craving? By not believing every thought in your head. How do you do that? By finding out that there's something inside of here besides your, your noisy mind. How do you do that? You sit down, you get quiet, you practice. So Vipassana meditation uh, follows this, this idea that, uh, that you, um, just like I said, you know, you, 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 create, you start with basic goodness. There are certain things you do and don't do to be a good person. Then you practice concentration. And when you first start doing it in the 10-day silent, by the way, 10-day silent meditation retreat, um, this, this has been going on now for 20-something years, I guess, and you can go anywhere in the world to these things and uh, and sit and meditate for ten days and and there are some talks every night they feed you they give you a bed to sleep in uh, and you don't talk to anybody you don't look at anybody if you walk by somebody in the hall you just kind of you know you're you're trying not to engage your thinking mind and your personality. Might I recommend a book about this? this the Art of Living. Uh, well, I was going to that, but also Ten Percent Happier. Oh. Uh, which is about uh, uh, Dan Harris, who's an ABC news Dan. anchor, yeah. who uh, you know discovered uh, meditation, um, and <laughs> as a very early beginner, decided to go on a ten-day meditation wow. and it, and it's it's a really great look from the perspective of a beginner's mind, a true beginner's mind, um, and and watching his experience with uh, the initial torture of it and, and then kind of growing into it and then suddenly having, you know, lack of a better word, uh, uh, an enlightenment about it. 10% so. happier. 10% happier. Thanks. I will definitely read that one. Steve, can I ask? 10% yeah. happier, 10-day meditation retreat. Is there some significance? To the number 10? 10? Uh, I'll take 10 days and get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Such a powerful experience. Um, and, and so your very first challenge is to learn how to focus your mind in the simple way to, that you, you're taught. is called uh, anapana breathing, which basically means sit down, shut up, follow your breath. That's it. You just sit there and you breathe. And you 
Try to keep your focused attention on the place where your air comes into your lungs and back out. In and out. That's it. You just sounds boring. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> but you know, boredom is one of the greatest impediments to our spiritual development. How do you how do you overcome that? Because every time I've tried anything that you're talking about, it's the boredom that I always. Okay, so here. <laughs> okay, so here's what happens. Everybody thinks that meditation is supposed to be a walk in the park. It's supposed to be like you know lights and fairies and you know energy and you know. <laughs> and so when they sit down to do it and it doesn't happen, they're like. <laughs> right? Here's what meditation really is. Meditation is a workout. You're exercising your, your, your focus muscles. That's what you're doing. Right? So you're going to lift it up and you have to put it back down again. You lift it up and you have to put it back down again. And every time you lift it, it's going to come back down. Now, most of us, the way we hold meditation is that it's like um, I focused and then I lost my focus, so I guess I'm not meditating. No, you have to lose your focus in order to bring it back again. It's a constant practice. Bring the puppy back to the paper. You're training a puppy, right? Bring the puppy back to the paper. You have to do it 10,000 times. And you, know, and you acknowledge up front that you feel boredom's like, you know, that's not, that's the least of it you know, at first. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's nasty in there. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to do this. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you learn more. Actually, this kind of goes to these other points. Um, which, which essentially, I'm going to go out of order and jump back in again, but basically... Um, the last two of the five, and I'm going to have to go back to the fourth one in a second, is learning and community. Learning and community. So learning is basically, you learn what that means. You learn what it means to experience boredom and just know that witnessing the boredom is just one more thing. It's, it's actually an illusion. It has no lasting reality inside of you. It's just you've been deathly afraid of feeling this feeling, and for that reason you've stayed inside of your invisible box. But if you push the, you know, you push the, the the weights and you put them back down, you push the weights and put them back down. Eventually, you have the necessary strength to move through and then to the other side of boredom. And when you get to the other side of boredom, you're like, oh, it's not so bad over here. So there's something kind of cool on the other side. So that's the learning part, and the other part is community. The Buddha said there's, uh, he says, take refuge in the three jewels. He says, take refuge in the the Buddha, the Dharma, uh, the, the, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So he didn't mean him when he said Buddha. Buddha meaning the quality of enlightenment. The, everything we've talked about up to now. The, you doing, um, you know, learning what it feels like to be in a state of enlightenment. Right? A state of being free from your mind. Take refuge in that. And once you start having that experience, take refuge in it. It's a good thing. The Dharma means the teaching, the learning. That's when you, you do the reading and you, you, know, you, you read other great people who have gone through this practice and, and find out that, oh, it's not that they were blessed with the ability to move, you know, that they you know, through enlightenment and, and they didn't have to deal with this, that they dealt with all these exact same things you're talking about, right? That's the learning part. And the third part is called Sangha, which basically means spiritual community. That means you get together with other people and you say, man, was I bored. <laughs> oh, my God. That was, this was the worst meditation ever. Oh, my God. It's like I, like I said, I, had, I, I got into a shame spiral. It was torture for me from the time of, like, right after your talk until about 10 minutes into my talk. <laughs> like, I was so stuck in my own head about, like, you know, I mean, I guess I'm still there a little bit, because I'm still, well like... The dressed was very funny. What was it? <laughs> oh, good, good. That was the one that triggered it, by the way. I stole it from you. Yeah, if you laughed a little bit more, I wouldn't be having this discussion right now. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> So, uh, so, it's, it's, so that's the, the, the spiritual community is the, is, is the, the salve on the, on the wound. It's the way that you move through this. It's witnessing and sharing. I witness myself. I witness you. I share with you what my experience of witnessing me was. And I allow myself to like, embrace your experience and your darkness and still see that you're okay. You're moving in the right direction. Just keep on going. It's okay. So having a good spiritual teacher... Having you know go to retreats, we uh, we do lead retreats periodically. Um, you know things where you bring, where you come together with other people who are on a similar path. It's very difficult to do it alone. Just is. Um, okay, so in the context of vipassana meditation, once you've begun to master the art of of focused concentration and relaxation, the next thing you do is you begin to apply it 
to your physical body. And this is what I call um, get out of your head and into your body. Most of us are like, you know, like basically the only reason we have a body is to transport this head around. <laughs> but the truth is that you've got a body. And you, you it, um, I think the third Zen patriarch said, you're not your body and you're not your mind, but if you were to choose one, you're much more your body than you are your mind. But we all think we're much more our mind than we are our body. So you've got to learn to get out of your head and into your body. So how do you do that? Well, you practice. So how do you practice? Well, the, the way that it's taught in Vipassana meditation is you sit there, you get quiet. Uh, let's do it. Let's all close our eyes for a moment. Take a deep breath. Put it all wet, relax. See if you can um, start the way I said to uh, put your, your focused attention on the air as it enters your nostrils and then leaves your nostrils. Now this is actually something that takes a while to get good at, but you can still see if you can feel the air moving in and out of your nostrils. That's something you can spend weeks doing all by itself and you get a lot of benefit from it. What I want you to do now is I want you to take your attention, this is only because we're giving a crash course right now, I want you to take your attention away from the, uh, the air as it comes in and out of your lungs and see if you can put your attention on the top of your head. Maybe an area about the size of a quarter or a half dollar. Notice whatever you feel in that part of your body. Whatever it is, nothing esoteric. It could be warmth or coolness. It could be tingling. It could be weight. Whatever it is, just let it be. And notice it. And then allow your attention to expand and move downward so that it begins to encompass the rest of the top of your head. So now your attention is residing all over the top of your head where, where a hat would be. Notice any <coughs> sensations that you feel there. Then warmth, tingling, itching. Sometimes you'll feel like there's movement, like little ants moving around on your head. Just notice it. Don't change it. Notice it. Bring your attention down to the sides of your face. Allow it to go down over your forehead. Doing this like a scan, just slowly scanning down your head. Noticing any sensations you feel along the way. Notice your ears. See if you feel any warmth coolness, <coughs> itching, whatever you notice, just let it be exactly the right thing. <coughs> Allow your sensation to move down into your jaw, mouth, or you can notice your lips as they touch one another. Down to your throat, and your neck. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to have you now do the advanced version of this, which is to see if you can become aware of your whole body. Just kind of notice any sensations as you widen your scope of inquiry to include your whole body. It might regionalize itself to one area or another, or you might even get a sense of the whole thing all at once. Just be with that for a moment. Whatever the sensations are, they're exactly the right ones. And then just, when you're ready, open your eyes back up again. The first time I ever did that, it was a profound experience. I don't know if any of you can, can, can grasp that. It's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's like your mind really does get very quiet. And your, and your awareness of yourself grows. And that experience has a spin-off, has many, many spin-off effects. But one of the spin-off effects is, is how you react to others, how your relationships play out. 
when I get in an, when I get upset now, something bothers me, I get irritated or angry or any of those feelings, I get out of my head and into my body. Instead of churning the thing that made me angry, I think, oh, anger. How interesting. I wonder where I feel that. I feel it in my throat. I feel tightness in my stomach. I feel heat in my face. I feel kind of a vibration in my legs. I become a, a scientist studying my own inner experience. That's called wisdom. That's the third step. Foundation, which is basic goodness, silence. Wisdom is the third step. Then learning and then community. So going back to wisdom, wisdom is a begin, beginning to have a dawning recognition that all the stuff that you think is causing your misery in life has nothing to do with why you're miserable. It just doesn't. So, um, so that's, that's how you begin to develop wisdom. And what I'd like to do, uh, and we want to kind of get ready to wrap up here soon, and we'd like to do this um, sharing experience. Um, and I wonder if I can do a quick read first. Would you, would you mind if I do that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think I have a ah. This is the last chap. This is, comes from the last chapter of Unhypnosis. Um, it's called How Our Journey Unfolds, and it's a couple pages of, of uh, my writing. It says, uh, How Our Journey Unfolds. We want a better life. We want a bigger house, a better car, or a smaller house, and a you know, smaller car, or a shared car. Um, <laughs> a more successful husband, fame, fortune, lots of other stuff. We hope that these things will make us happy, yet we find that they don't. We eventually come to realize the truth. Our source of happiness is within. Our striving for a better life does feed us and inspire us, but not for the reasons we think. We're inspired by the journey, not the destination. We're made more alive by the experience of co-creating our universe in conjunction with certain laws of nature. We come to realize that laws of prosperity and success are the same as the laws of nature. All things come and go. They arise, they remain a while, they dissolve. We had that experience with that when you were talking about giving away the child's clothing. Everything is flowing. Everything is transient. We begin to embrace the idea that our happiness is tied directly to our ability to appreciate the flow. We stop holding on to things. We face the fear of letting go, and we experiment with the art of giving. We discover what, that when we give of ourselves, we always get filled back up. All right? Nothing we have requires us to hold on to it so tightly that we squeeze out every last little nugget of enjoyment. We play with the idea of trust. We take baby steps toward trusting the benevolence of the universe. We set goals and find that we're enlivened by them. We get what we want, become cocky and arrogant, and then lose it, and we regain our humility. And it happens again and again and again. And still, we strive to improve ourselves. Sometimes, we get weary, and we get resigned. Surely, it's easier to stay stuck where we are than to risk yet another disappointment. But before long, the resignation feels like a death. And we become willing to take a chance on life again. We stumble upon wisdom. Universal truths present themselves. We start to notice commonalities between various philosophies, sciences, religions. We become curious about the things that everyone seems to be saying. Those things upon which everyone agrees can't be ignored. We take note of the fact that science and religion are coming together. We hear that we have the power to direct our consciousness, and that in doing so, we can create our lives. <coughs> The message is optimistic, but our experience frustrates us. In a world of infinite possibility, we ask, why do we continue to recreate the same limited reality again and again? So in search of an answer, we study ourselves. It's my favorite line right now. We find that our minds are habitual abusers of our souls, repeat offenders. We lament that if we were half as abusive to others as we are to ourselves, we'd be in jail. Our minds need training. We learn to use tools to bring about a shift in consciousness, but we find that our mind is very clever. It uses our tools against us. We attempt to overcome anger and fear, and finally we become angry at our anger and afraid of our fear. <laughs> we search for answers, and we again gain and lose, and we again gain and lose, and here we are, all of us a bit wounded but resilient, a bit discouraged but hopeful. We're ready to try something new, and although we have our doubts, we take the leap, and we rejoice at the end of the journey because we are alive. 
So, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. uh,